Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ivy Chapel, United Church of Christ. We're pleased that you're here with us to share in worship today. Some people are in the sanctuary. Praise the Lord for that. And those of you at home, we rejoice that you're joining in also. Uh, let's see, I wanted to review with you some people that I was going to lift up in uh, prayers during worship later on. Uh, just reviewing more or less for God's healing and God's presence with them. We wanted to pray for Joshua Lockyer, who is the grandson of Catherine Kuntzman. He has acute leukemia. Earl Washburn, Russ Washburn's brother, uh, who's continuing to uh, have a hopeful recovery following a mild stroke. Jen Davidson, who, uh, as you may recall, it's a friend of my wife, Sue's. She's pregnant and she learned that she has breast cancer. So she's uh, receiving chemotherapy during her pregnancy. And her husband, Deegan Davidson. My list is over there. Uh, so the uh, last person I wanted to, uh, I guess, highlight to lift up for today is Dr. Bella Mae Winters. Uh, she is already serving as the associate pastor at St. John's United Church of Christ in St. Charles. But today at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Bella Mae is going to be ordained. And so we celebrate with Bella and the uh, St. John's United Church of Christ and the wider body of Christ at that uh, joyous occasion, 2 o'clock today. And I noticed on our table, this is primarily for folks who are in the sanctuary currently, but also if you had a chance to come by during the week, materials are available for the Mary and Martha Group plant sale, which is going to be coming up uh, in and around Sunday, May 2nd. So we have lists of uh, plants for you to purchase. And I think I read in keeping you posted that the uh, proceeds, the profits that are made by the plant sale are going to be given to food pantries that Ivy supports. So be sure to uh, buy some plants and engage in growing things as spring takes hold. Also, we're going to be having a Zoom coffee hour after worship today. So uh, tune in and we can connect with each other in that way. Any other announcements I'm missing? All right. So glad you're among us. Let's prepare our hearts to praise living God on this beautiful morning.
I invite all who are able in the sanctuary to stand for our call to worship. And everybody at home and here today in person, you might want to note this is a little weird because we're kind of accustomed to we alternate with the leader and then the congregation and then the leader. But today we've got a, a number of places where uh, I'm saying two lines in a row, okay? So if you get over anxious and chime in with me, that'll be all right too. Anyway, let's share together in our call to worship today. <clears throat> Jesus, we hear you say, peace be with you. People rage with contempt. The land is consumed by violence. The air of the atmosphere is polluted. How can we claim peace in a time like this? Peace be with you. Jesus, we hear you say, receive the Holy Spirit. We are afraid of this spirit, too disturbed by it, too overwhelmed by it. Isn't your spirit a gift too powerful to be entrusted to humankind? Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we hear you say, see my hands. We do not want to see the wounds of the world. There are too many to recall, too many places scarred by injury. Why won't you let us look away? See my hands. Jesus, we hear you say, Reach out your hand. We are so bound up in your love, Jesus, that your peace, your spirit, even your pain will not let us go. Therefore, we remember, we marvel, and we move forward in faith. Reach out your hand. Jesus, we hear you say, do not doubt, but believe. Our Lord and our God, you are alive. Please be seated. 
And I invite everyone to share with me in our unison prayer of invocation. Let us pray. God of Easter joy, you can do anything. You are so flat out supreme that you frighten us, amazing God. As we continue sharing time with you, we eventually grow somewhat more at ease in your presence, God. Through your patient love, we learn that anyone and everyone can safely come to you with our joys, our sorrows, our fears, our complaints, our doubts. God of Easter joy, we are grateful to you for teaching us your way of life. Draw us away from the ways of this world. We praise you for the wholeness which you provide, God. Bring together the broken pieces of fragmented human lives. Help all people to accept who you are and to receive the love that you offer. Come now and guide this time of worship, we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm preempting the children's message with a couple of <laughs> program notes. Sue and I had decided together uh, ahead of time, we're gonna scramble the order of worship a little bit and the children's message is coming now and then we'll have our first scripture reading of the morning. And secondly, because my sheet of announcements was over to the side of the chancel this morning, I neglected to make an announcement which I was asked to make today. The Board of Christian Education has asked me to announce that we are in need of volunteers to offer the children's message during worship this month and in the month of May. Please contact Sarah Heend. Thank you for sharing a message with God's children. So the scripture you're gonna hear in a little bit is about Doubting Thomas. And I want to start out by saying, well, good morning, children. Even the children, the big children sitting in the sanctuary, good morning. Um, I really miss you guys, because this would have been great to have you sitting around with me. So there's this book called Ripley's Believe It or Not. And the writer of this book, Robert Ripley, enjoys, enjoyed collecting odd facts, strange facts that you may or may not believe. Um, and although they seem unbelievable, they were true. So an example of this is a man by the name of James Cook once had a chicken that laid a perfectly square egg. Now, I've seen white eggs, brown eggs, spotted eggs, but I have never seen a square chicken egg. Have you? 
I think I'd have to see it to believe it. Joanne Barnes was a 15-year-old from California, and she once swung a lot of hula hoops on her body. Any guesses on how many? 115. Oh, good guess, but it was 68. Can you believe that? I can't even do one hula hoop. And the largest hot dog. How long do you think the largest hot dog was? Any guesses? Two feet. Two feet. Oh, no. Up, Gail, up. Hmm, even more. The largest hot dog was over 3,000 feet long and weighed 885 pounds and took 103 butchers to carry it. Now, that's a lot of baloney. I would have to see that to believe it. And there are many, many more things in this book that are true, whether or not we see it. So today, we learned that on the Sunday Jesus rose from the grave, he appeared to a group of the disciples. One of the disciples, whose name was Thomas, was not there. When the disciples told Thomas they had seen Jesus and that he was alive, Thomas said, eh, I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes. I want to put my finger in the nail prints of his hand. I want to put my hand in the wound in his side. So a week later, Thomas saw Jesus. And Jesus invited him to touch the wounds in his hand and the wound in his side. And Jesus believed, or G Thomas believed. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And there are a lot of people today won't believe that Jesus really rose from the grave because they haven't seen him with their own two eyes. Well, you know what? It's true, whether they believe it or not. You and I have never seen Jesus, but we believe. We accept him by faith, and we don't have to see it to believe it. Let's bow and let's pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you that you help us accept by faith that you have risen from the grave and that you are alive. In Jesus' name, amen. So our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. There are actually two sections. One is in chapter 2 and one in chapter 4 of the book of Acts, which describe what I would call the character of the life of the early church. And this is one of those, it's probably the longer of the two. Acts chapter 2. The disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' instructions and the communal life and to the breaking of bread and prayers. A reverent fear overtook all of them, for many wonders and signs were being performed daily by the apostles. Those who believed lived together, shared all things in common, they would sell their property and goods, sharing the proceeds with one another as each had need. They met in the temple. They broke bread together in their homes. 
With joyful and sincere hearts, they took their meals in common, praising God and supporting the goodwill of all people. Day by day, God added to their number those who were being saved. So, friends, the feature Sunday, celebrating the hallmark event of our faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Sunday is past for another year. This morning finds us one week out from Resurrection Day. The appointed scripture reading for this day from the Gospel of John ties last Sunday and this Sunday together. So here now, John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. <clears throat> when evening on that, 
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As God has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, when he did come back, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. One week later, his disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Come here, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not be faithless, but faithful. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in Jesus' name. The disciple named Thomas is spoken of a total of 11 times in the entire New Testament. So that might not seem like a a lot. I mean, it really isn't a lot. But then consider this. Once in Matthew, once in Mark, once in Luke, once in the Acts of the Apostles. And the rest, in in those scriptures, each time Thomas' name is mentioned just as a part of a list of Jesus' disciples. There is nothing more written about Thomas other than his name in Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and Acts 1. Based on those occurrences alone, we would know little about Thomas. The Gospel of John is the one place in Scripture that provides us with any view of his personality. So if you did your math, there's 11 uses in the New Testament, four are in four other books of the New Testament, at least seven times that Thomas is mentioned in John. In John chapter 14, Don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them. Just the two biggies. Because sometimes Thomas' name is thrown in in John, too, as a part of a list of the names of the twelve. But in John chapter 14, once Jesus has taught the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again. You know the way to the place that I'm going. Guess who? Thomas is the one who speaks up and questions, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? From this exchange, I think we get a good idea, a pretty good look at Thomas as someone who has a difficult to convince, skeptical nature. Our gospel reading this morning is the best known story about Thomas in the Bible, of course. Based on this incident, the church has slapped a label on Thomas. What's his nickname? What do we call Thomas? Yes, that's right, Doubting Thomas. And why is this? Don't answer. Uh, I'll try to shed some light on it. So everybody knows, uh, you know, it's like when we have friends and we associate a certain quality with them, just automatically. Everybody knows Thomas is doubting Thomas. Seeing is believing. We've all heard that expression, right? In essence, Thomas is saying, I'll believe it when I see it, just like we heard in our children's message this morning. Jesus humors Thomas. Jesus says, okay then, put your finger in the nail holes, put your hand in my pierced side, see for yourself. But interesting, in the original language of the New Testament, in Koine Greek, the word doubt is not used by Jesus. It is we who profess that Thomas doubted, and we who label him doubting Thomas. John 20, verse 27, which is a part of today's reading, Jesus says to Thomas, don't be faithless, but be faithful. So that's the word there. It kind of literally means without faith. Don't be without faith. Be faithful. The without faith thing is what we have kind of shifted into uh, translating as doubt. Which isn't a wrong translation, but it's just, I guess my heart goes out to Thomas because, you know, he had a few moments just like some of the other disciples, namely Simon Peter, he had some triumphs, and he also had some times when he really bombed out. And it seems like we really hold Thomas's feet to the fire for this uh, incident here. And, uh, and then to me, it's intriguing that not even Jesus of Nazareth calls Thomas doubting Thomas, or uses the word doubt in today's gospel read. Okay, enough of that, but I, it does fascinate me. By his wounds we are healed. Do you recognize this phrase? Where have we heard this before? One week ago Friday, right? We heard this on Good Friday as we do most every Good Friday. And I wore something, I don't know if you can actually see this here because in some of our recent live streams, the shots have been pretty far away. I'm not sure if that's the cut down on glare off my forehead or what that is exactly, but I'm wearing a piece of jewelry, I guess you could call it today. It's a little necklace and it's kind of small, but uh, if you can envision, everybody knows what a plus sign looks like, right? And this is actually five. It's, it's like a big, you could call it a cross, because it really does represent a cross. And then in each quadrant, in each one of the four uh, sections that are, that are made up by this first big plus sign, is another little one. So then you add them up, one, two, three, four, five. Those are the five 
Five wounds of Christ. Two in his feet, two in his hands, one in his side. And, oh, I could delve into that a little bit deeper, but I won't today, in terms of the way that the crucifixion and Jesus' burial fulfilled prophecies. Prophecies of God that were given to God's people generations before Jesus of Nazareth was even born. By his wounds we are healed. It's from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. And one of my uh, spiritual guides is a priest named Ari Nowen. And Ari Nowen writes describing Christ our Savior as the wounded healer. The wounded healer. Consider this. In the first century at the time Jesus of Nazareth was teaching and ministering to people, what an unheard of gift. The very Son of God, through his injuries, his pain, his woundedness, giving everyone else healing. In so many ways, this is beyond us. How could Jesus' suffering and death accomplish this? As we heard in the final verse of our opening worship hymn this morning, crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. Truly, Christ is the healer of all the world. And bring it home, right? By his wounds we are healed. The Jerusalem cross representing the five wounds of Christ. Well, let's think about this story maybe from a slightly different angle. Touch. Many months ago, a United Church of Christ pastor in Massachusetts wrote about her pandemic experience, at least up to that point in time. And she had some thoughts which I thought were really great, and then I ran across this today because uh, I'd made some notes about it, and I thought, this fits in with the Gospel of John. Vicki is her first name. Pastor Vicki writes, Touch was central to Jesus' ministry. The Gospels include 10 references to Jesus touching others and 15 references to people touching Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but those numbers actually sounded low to me. I was surprised that there were only 10 and 15. But it's, you know, the touch in one direction or the other. Vicki writes, after his resurrection, Jesus invites his disciples to touch him, wounds and all. Human touch has the capacity to heal and empower. Consensual touch connects us to one another and helps us feel safe and cherished. But the pandemic has severely limited touching. And Pastor Vicki is writing all of this. She goes on, I live alone. And I have been touched just four times by other people doing their jobs during the pandemic. Pastor Vicki writes, as a way of loving and protecting others, I have not touched anyone. Skin hunger, she calls it, is a real thing. In these days of lockdown and distancing, many of us have it. So let's find ways to touch one another with all the love and care of the God who reaches, up, who reaches out to us in the flesh.
for me, that's a powerful message. Uh, and it, maybe I'm getting away from the gospel a little bit this morning, but I feel like we're all struggling as uh, the coronavirus pandemic churns on one year plus at this point. We have that skin hunger, don't we? we we're trying to care for each other by not getting too close to others, by not exposing one another to germs and the like. But in the course of all of that, there, there is an absence of something which I think is, is sort of a foundational core human experience, physical touch. Now, if anyone other than the Son of God were urging us to live life by putting on a blindfold and going forward with our lives, we would probably dismiss them as a kook. Truth be told, even when it is the Son of God who tells us these things, believing is believing not seeing. We sometimes write Jesus off as sort of flaky, or at least we just dismiss that part of his message. But Jesus is calling upon us to have a faith that goes beyond what we can see and touch. And that's very difficult to do, especially in terms of the human touch aspect right now. We're living this difficult challenge. So Jesus' words in the gospel today are beautiful words, anchors for us in our faith journey. Among the things that he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Earlier in his ministry, it almost sounds like a riddle when Jesus says, I myself came into this world so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. These are Jesus' words in chapter 9, verse 39. And in today's gospel, as we have heard, Thomas sticks his neck out and demands, I want proof. I won't believe unless I see it for myself. And aren't we all to some extent like Thomas? We think to ourselves and at times we say out loud, I need proof. Proof Jesus is the Son of God. Proof Jesus died. Proof of the resurrection. Proof Jesus arose from death and physically came back to life. Proof God forgives my sin. Proof God loves me. Proof that there is an, even is a God. Yes, we are so much like Thomas. Putting conditions on believing, demanding that we must have proof. Oh, really, says Jesus to every Thomas everywhere. Oh, really? Well, go ahead then. Put your finger here. Reach your hand in my side. Feel free. Touch me. Take a look. But as you do, let me tell you this. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. This is faith. Seeing is not believing. Jesus teaches believing is believing. To Thomas and to each one of us, Jesus says, we heard it already. Jesus says, don't be faithless, be faithful. And so our text begins on the evening of the first day of the week. That's last Sunday, Resurrection Day. Verse 19, the story starts up. 
the disciples have hidden themselves away. They saw what happened to Jesus, and they're terrified. So they went back to the house where they all ate the Passover feast together, and they're inside, locked up, no way in or out. The text concludes one week later. Oh, what do you know? Here we are, one week later. The Son of God goes in this same house in a manner not all that different from the way that he went out of the tomb. On each occasion, Jesus didn't come in through the door. But there he was, in that house, sealed up, tighter than a drum. How is a mystery? And that's okay. The ways of God are holy mysteries. How he got in isn't important. What is important is Jesus appeared. Jesus came. Jesus was with his followers. That's the way it was for the first disciples. That's the way it is for us. Once Jesus comes into our lives, he never leaves. We may think we've closed ourselves off, but he finds a way back in. We may not figure out how. That doesn't matter. Jesus is with us, still with us, still speaking. Receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Let us pray. Living God, risen Savior, bless us with faith to believe in you sight unseen. Remind us this morning of your sacred promise. Things seen are temporary. Things not seen are eternal. God, we give you thanks for your constant presence with all people. God, we praise you for your living presence in our life together as your church, Ivy Chapel United Church of Christ. You, Christ Jesus, are the foundation and the leader of this ministry. May we live open and receptive to your guidance. Breathe your spirit upon us so that we may serve as ambassadors of your peace, Jesus. Living God, risen Savior, wash over your daughter Bellamy Winters as she is ordained for ministry in your name. We pray that Bella will receive anew your spirit. In addition, we pray for Joshua Lockyer, Earl Washburn, Jen Davidson, Dagan Davidson, and all who are receiving medical treatment, physical therapy, or undergoing surgery this coming week. Bless each one with an inner calm. May your gospel word this day steady and reassure each one. Receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. In your mercy, Christ Jesus, hear our prayer. And we join our voices together now in the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, receive God's benediction. In the name of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, may the sacred mysteries of God calm your soul and bless you. Christ is risen. Receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. May your life be an Alleluia. Amen. <laughs>